class and welcome back to um, the second half of the lecture on chapter 12. We'll be going over parts C and D. Um, these chapters are a little heavy in the nervous system, so I try to skip over the things that you guys don't need to know. Um, so we're going to look a little bit about the functional brain systems, and these are networks of neurons that work together but span wide areas of the brain. We have our limbic system and reticular system. Um, the limbic system has different structures with it, um, includes parts of the diencephalon and some cerebral structures that encircle the brainstem. Uh, the fornix is the word to describe just the fiber tract of neurons that links the limbic system regions together. Um, the limbic system is a large part of the emotional or affective brain, so it recognizes angry or fearful facial expressions, assesses danger, elicits a fear response, or another part of the limbic system called the cingulate gyrus plays a role in expressing emotions via gestures and resolving mental conflicts. So here's a look at the limbic system. Um, again, so these parts of the nervous system in the brain, um, what I want you is to know is the general function, but you don't need to know all the details of what each part of the limbic system does. Um, the limbic system also puts emotional responses to odors. So for example, skunks smell bad. And most of the output is relayed via your hypothalamus, and that plays a role in psychosomatic illnesses. The limbic system interacts with different prefrontal lobes. Um, the hippocampus and the ambigaloid body also plays a role in memory. And then reticular formation extends through the central core of the brain. Um, it connections allow it to govern the brain arousal between the brain stem and other columns within the brain. Reticular activating system is called the RAS system. Um, what this does, it filters out repetitive, familiar, or weak stimuli. It's inhibited by sleep centers, alcohol, or drugs. So severe injury to this system can result in a permanent unconsciousness or a coma. Motor functions of the reticular formation help to control coarse limb movements via reticulospinal tracts. And there's different motor functions in different centers within that reticular system. So here's the reticular system formation. Again, how it radiates through different areas of the brain. Again, you don't need to know all the specifics of the reticular and limbic system. Um, these next four slides are important for giving you just a brief kind of summary of the functions of the major brain regions. And to be honest, outside of these four slides, um, I mean, you should have a good understanding of the entire chapter, but these four slides and just the function of the major regions are all that I will want you to know, you know, about the limbic system or the hypothalamus or the thalamus, for example. Um, the function of the midbrain, the pons, the medulla, the function of the reticular formation. That This is really a great summary that you guys can focus your studying on. Um, outside of these four slides, I probably won't ask you too much if you... These are the only four slides you study in the entire chapter. You'll probably answer most of the questions correct on the test. Higher mental functions include language, memory, brain waves, EEGs, which show us brain waves, consciousness, sleep, and wake cycles. Uh, language implementation involves association cortex in the left hemisphere. We have our Broca's area which is involved in speech production. So patients with a lesion or an injury to the Broca's area understand words but cannot speak. And then the Wernicke's area is involved in understanding spoken word and written words. So for example, a patient with a lesion in the Wernicke area could be able to speak, but the words would be nonsensical. And corresponding areas on the right side are involved with nonverbal language components. So here's a look, just again, a great review of the functional and structural areas of the cerebral cortex. We've seen this slide several times in the first part of this lecture, um, understanding the anatomy and just the basic functions of each part of the brain is important. Outside of that, I'm not going to ask you too many details. So memory is the storage and retrieval of information. You have different kinds of memory. Um, declarative memory, procedural memory, motor memory, and emotional memory, um, the memory of an experience is linked to an emotion. There's two stages of declarative memory storage. You have short-term memory and long-term memory. Short-term memory is temporary holding of information. This is usually limited to just seven or eight pieces of information, and then your long-term memory has a limitless capacity. Factors affecting the transfer from an event from a short-term memory to a long-term memory are your emotional state, 
So you're best if you're alert, motivated, surprised, or aroused. This is why people drink caffeine in the morning because it helps them with their memory. Rehearsal, repetition, and practice. So what you're learning right now about memory, you can apply to how you study for your classes. Uh, make sure you're in a good emotional state when you're studying. Uh, re repeat and practice, write things down as you're studying them. Associate things, so tie new information with old memories. Um, if you know of anyone who's died of, um, I don't know, a heart attack or diabetes, you can associate maybe a, a kind of a sad memory, but you can associate that with learning about what causes heart attacks or what is diabetes. And then automatic memory is just the subconscious information stored in long-term memory. Memory consolidation involves fitting new facts into categories already stored in the cerebral cortex, the hippocampus, the temporal cortical areas, the thalamus, and the prefrontal cortex are involved in cons consolidation. So here's a look at memory processing and how things get from short-term to long-term memory um, and the outside stimuli, which could affect your memory. So sight, um, pain, hearing, smell, Damage to the hippocampus or surrounding temporal lobe structures on either side result in only slight memory loss and bilateral destruction causes widespread amnesia. Anterior grade amnesia is consolidated memories that are not lost, but new inputs are not associated with the old one. So for example, the person lives in the here and now and a memory of a conversation from just five minutes before uh, would not be remembered. Pretty sure my dad has that. Then retrograde amnesia is loss of memories formed in the distant past. So your brain waves reflect electrical activity of higher mental functions and normal brain functions are continuous and really hard to measure. So we measure um, your electrical activity that accompanies brain function with the electroencephalogram and EEG. And this is used for diagnosing epilepsy, seizures, sleep disorders, um, it's helpful to localize where a lesion or damage, a tumor, um, an infarct is scarring or damage of the tissue, infections and abscess. It's used in research and also to determine brain death. So um, to be medically dead, the brain will not emit any um, electrical activity. That's the medical definition of death. It's th the death of the brain. So to take an EEG, electrodes are placed on the scalp to measure electrical potential differences between various cortical areas as seen here. The EEG measures patterns of neuronal electrical activity that are generated by the synaptic activity. So how the neurons are passing um, through the signal through their synapses. Um, each person's brain waves are unique and the patterns can change with your age, what is stimuli, stimulating the brain, brain disease, and the chemical state of the body. Um, the waves are measured in hertz and the numbers of peaks per second, and it can be grouped into four classes based on hertz, alpha, beta, theta, and delta waves. You guys don't need to know the different types of waves, um, but I just want you to know that the EEG will show um, the stimulation of different parts of the brain, and it's really helpful in diagnosing disease and figuring out if there's a problem. An epileptic seizure is a torrent of electrical discharges by groups of neurons. So a seizure prevents any other messages from getting through, so the victim may lo lose consciousness, fall very stiffly, and have uncontrollable jerking. Um, it's something really hard to see, especially if it's your kid. Um, epilepsy is not associated with any sort of intellectual impairment, and it occurs in about 1% of the population, so not very common, but still 1%, and genetic factors could play a role but brain injuries, stroke, infections, or tumors could also be a cause. The, an aura, a sensory hallucination could precede a seizure. So some people can um, kind of determine if a seizure is going to be occurring. Uh, abscess seizure, seizure are mild seizures of young children where their expression goes blank for a few seconds. And then a tonic clonic seizure um, is the most severe, it lasts a few minutes, bone can be, bones can be broken, you can lose your bowel and bladder control, um, and you could bite your tongue. You guys don't need to know the differences of seizures, but I included in here um, because you might um, encounter it in your future healthcare field, so I think it's important to take a look. Control of ep epilepsy includes anti-convulsive drugs, vagus nerve stimulator, or deep brain stimulator implantations that will deliver pulses 
to the vagus nerve or directly to the brain to stabilize the brain activity. So now we'll talk about consciousness and this involves the perception of sensation. So uh, it's a voluntary initiation and control of movement. Capabilities are associated with higher mental processing and it's clinically defined on a continuum that grades the behavior in response to a stimuli. So alertness, drowsiness, lethargy, stupor, or coma. Current suppositions on consciousness that involves this, a simultaneous activity of very large cortical areas. Um, it's superimposed on other neural activities and it's holistic and all interconnected. So that means in order to be completely conscious and, uh, conscious and aware, um, it has to do with several um, brain areas coming together. Um, except during sleep, the loss of consciousness signals that the brain function is impaired for some reason or other. Fainting, also known as syncope, is a brief loss of consciousness. It's most often due to inadequate cerebral blood flow to the brain, and it's due to low blood pressure or ischemia from a hemorrhage or a sudden severe emotional stress. And then a coma is unconsciousness for an extended period of time. It's not the same as a deep sleep. Um, the oxygen consumption will be much lowered. Brain death is then an irreversible coma, and this is the... Um, ethical and legal issues surround decisions on whether a person is dead or alive. And again, the medically correct term for being dead or alive always has to do um, with electrical activity in the brain. If there's no electrical activity, the person is considered brain dead. Um, and that is where we get into a lot of ethical and legal issues. Sleep then is a state of partial unconsciousness from which a person can be aroused by stimulation the cortical activity is depressed, but the brainstem activity doesn't change. So there's types of sleep as defined by EEG, EEG patterns. You can have non-rapid eye movement, which is broken into four stages. And then the rapid eye movement, the REM sleep, that's considered the deep sleep. So here are the types of sleep. We pass through the first two stages of the non-rapid eye movement during the first 30 to 45 minutes of sleep, and then move on to stages three and four. This is slow wave sleep. Um, changes in your body happen during these four stages. And then at about 90 minutes in, the fourth stage ends and our REM sleep begins abruptly. Um, you have kind of this temporary paralysis. So you're in a deep sleep, except for rapid eye movements. Your oxygen consumption, heart rate, and breathing increase. And the increase can even be greater than when awake. And most dreaming occurs during your REM sleep. So here's just the different stages of sleep and how the EEG patterns look. Sleep is regulated. Um, so alternate cycles of sleep and wakefulness reflect natural circadian or a 24 hour rhythm. Um, your RAS activity, that's the center in the brain is inhibited during sleep, uh, but RAS also mediates sleep stages. Um, and you can have different parts of the brain that release different things to help you wake up and go back to sleep. So here's the typical progression of an adult through one nights of sleep and where it is in terms of um, what stages it's in. The importance of sleep, um, slow wave sleep. So the non-rapid eye movement stages three and four are presumed to be a restorative state of stage of the body. And people deprived of REM sleep, that extremely deep sleep become moody and depressed. Um, I'm a mom of an infant, so I'm probably not getting enough REM sleep. REM sleep may give the brain opportunity to analyze your, the day's events and work through an emotional event or a problem. And it also eliminates the unneeded synapses that were formed um, to dream, to forget things. So REM sleep is incredibly important. Daily sleep requirements actually decline with age. So stage four, sleep declines steadily and may disappear after age 60 years. Narcolepsy is a sleep disorder involving an abrupt lapse into sleep from an awake state. And insomnia is the chronic inability to obtain the amount of quality of sleep needed. This could possibly be caused by several things, depression, anxiety, overuse of caffeine, um, computer and cell phone use too close to bedtime. And it may be treated by blocking the orexin action. Um, meninges, then, so then we're going to get into, now we're going to get into a little more anatomy. Um, the function of the meninges is to cover and protect your central nervous system. So there's three layers. They protect the blood vessels and enclose the venous sinuses. 
They contain cerebral spinal fluid. They form partitions in the skull. And hopefully from anatomy, you remember from external to internal, the three meningeal layers are the dura matter, the arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. And this is a very common picture you've probably seen before. So when we look at the skull going from superficial to deep, you have the skin of the scalp, which is incredibly thin. The periosteum covers the bone. And then you have the dura matter, arachnoid matter, and then the pia matter layers. I'll let you guys review the meningi layers on your own. They are important to know, but again, hope that's a, this is a review from anatomy. Um, if you guys are wondering why I always say you should review this from anatomy, because the textbook that we're using um, is kind of an anatomy and physiology combo textbook. So some of you might have used this textbook in your anatomy class, but that's why I keep, there's a lot of anatomy in the textbook. If you're ever wondering why I'm telling you to just kind of review this section on your own. Uh, the dural septa and the dural sin venous sinuses, um, this refers to how blood is drained from the different parts of the brain. So it's drained into these sinuses and then travels down the neck back to the heart. The arachnoid matter, again, I'll let you review this. It's the middle meningeal layer. And then the pia matter um, is the delicate, delicate connective tissue that clings tightly to every convolution and contour of the brain. Meningitis, whenever you see the word itis, it means an inflammation of something. So meningitis is an inflammation of the meninges. Um, it's actually extremely dangerous because it may spread to the central nervous system, which could lead to inflammation of the brain, referring to encephalitis. Meningitis is usually diagnosed by observing, observing microbes in a sample of cerebral spinal fluid obtained via a lumbar puncture. So your cerebral spinal fluid then forms a liquid cushion of constant volume around the brain. It gives buoyancy to the brain. It reduces the weight of the brain by floating. It, produces, it protects your central nervous system from blows and other trauma. And it also nourishes the brain and carries chemical signals. It's composed of a watery solution formed from blood plasma, but with less protein and different ion concentrations from the plasma. The choroid plexus then is a cluster of capillaries that hangs from the roof of each ventricle enclosed by the pia matter um, and it surrounds the layer of ependymal cells. Cerebral spinal fluid is filtered from the plexus as a, at a constant rate and your ependymal cells use ion pumps to control the composition of the cerebral spinal fluid and also help to help cleanse the cerebral spinal fluid by removing wastes. Um, the cilia of the ependymal cells help keep the cerebral spinal fluid in motion, so it kind of moves it around. And the normal adult um, cerebral spinal fluid volume is about 150 milliliters, and that's replaced every eight hours because it's the way of reviewing waste from the brain. So here's just a look at the formation, location, and circulation of cerebral spinal fluid. It begins where number one, the choroid plexus of each ventricle will produce cerebral spinal fluid, and then that flows through the ventricles and into the subarachnoid space via the median and lateral apertures. Cerebral spinal fluid flows through the subarachnoid space to surround the brain. It'll be absorbed into the dural venous sinus via the arachnoid granulations. This just shows how the cerebral spinal fluid um, is filtered and kind of is, is created through the section of the choroid plexus. Hydrocephalus is an obstruction that blocks cerebral spinal fluid circulation or drainage, resulting in increased pressure. And this is sometimes seen in newborns where the skull bones are unfused. So increased pressure can cause the head to enlarge. And in adults, the rigid rigidity of the skull keeps pressure within, potentially leading to brain damage and it can compress blood vessels and crush the soft nervous tissue. Um, treatment is to drain off excess cerebral spinal fluid with a ventricular shunt um, to the abdominal cavity. And this is a look at a newborn with hydrocephalus. Um, if you're wondering, hydrocephalus was sometimes um, a telltale sign of a pregnant woman who got the Zika virus from mosquitoes when that was a little more common, um, more common in developing countries, but she would often have babies with this hydrocephalus and the enlarged um, skull. Then the blood-brain barrier helps to maintain a stable environment for the brain. It has chemical variations that could lead to uncontrollable neuron firings. 
and substances from the blood must pass through the continuous endothelium of capillary walls before gaining ent entry into neurons. So the blood-brain barrier has incredibly tight junctions that ensure substances pass through, not around endothelial cells. Um, it, there's feet of astrocytes and smooth muscle-like pericytes that surround endothelial cells just to help to promote, promote this tight junction. So basically what your blood-brain barrier is doing is it's forming a barrier uh, between your arteries and your brain, all the neurons, so that anything in the brain, like drug, alcohol, it drugs, some can get through that blood-brain barrier and others cannot. So it's a way of the brain to protect itself. Substances move through these endothelial cells via simple diffusion and specific transport mechanisms. So here's just a look at how, what most capillaries look like. And the brain capillaries are surrounded by these extra astrocyte feet with tight junctions um, to try to disallow anything harmful that to get from the um, blood into the neuron, the brain. Some things can get through this blood-brain barrier and drugs and alcohol, certain types of drugs and alcohol are one of them. So the thick basement membrane surrounding the capillaries is the last part of the barrier that the substances must get through. And it is absent in some areas like vomiting and hypothalamus. And this is important because if you um, ingest something harmful, you don't want, you want that to get into your brain. So your brain knows I got to get this out of my body. So that's why it's absent in some areas. Traumatic brain injuries. Um, I think this, we're pretty close to getting done with part C can include a concussion, um, a contusion, a subdural or subarachnoid hemorrhage, and a cerebral edema. So review those different types of traumatic brain injuries. Um, cerebral vascular accidents, CVAs, these are also known as strokes. Um, ischemia is when the tissue is deprived of blood supply, uh, usually leading to the death of brain tissue. And this can be caused uh, by a blockage of a cerebral artery by a blood clot. And glutamate can act as an excitotoxin, which can actually worsen the condition. Hemiplegia is the paralysis on one side, um, often ac uh, accommodates a stroke where sensory or speech deficits may result. A transient ischemic attack, TIA, is a temporary episode of reversible cerebral ischemia. And a tissue plus minogen activator is only a, the only approved treatment for a stroke. Alzheimer's disease is the progressive degenerative disease of the brain that results in dementia. Uh, key proteins appear to be misfolded, malfunctioned. Um, it's accompanied by memory loss, short attention span, disorientation, eventual, la eventual language loss, irritability, moodiness, confusion, hallucinations. Um, it's incredibly hard to watch your loved one go through Alzheimer's disease. Um, brain cells actually die and the brain will actually shrink size um, as shown in these two pictures, um, MRIs between a normal and an Alzheimer brain. Parkinson's disease is the generate degeneration of the dopamine releasing neurons of the stem, substantia nigra. Um, it's accompanied by tremors, inability to control movements. There's no treatment for this as well. Um, research into stem cell transplants is promising, um, but there's no specific treatment yet. Then Huntington's disease is a fatal hereditary disorder caused by the accumulation of the protein Huntington in brain cells. Initial symptoms involved wild, jerky, flapping movements, and it's later marked by mental retardation. And it's usually fatal within 15 years of onset. Huntington's disease is scary because you don't know um, you have the gene for it until it usually doesn't um, present itself until later in life. Um, it can be treated with drugs that block dopamine effects and stem cell implant research is also promising. Um, diagnostic procedures for assessing central nervous system dysfunction um, include simple tests like your knee jerk reflex with the hammer tapped against the quadriceps tendon. So you, we, you probably always wonder why the doctor does that. Um, and an abnormal response could indicate intracranial hemorrhage. So your brain in your, your bleeding in your brain, multiple sclerosis or hydrocephalus. So that simple knee jerk reflex with the hammer um, can tell the doctor a lot of things about your brain function. CT, MRI, PET scans are also important for quick identification of tumors. 
lesions, plaque, or areas of infarct, or um, infarct just means damaged by some region or the other. And then the cerebral angiography uses x-rays with dye to pinpoint any stroke causing clots. And then ultrasound can also be used to evaluate blood flow through the arteries feeding the brain. So this is part C. Um, I'm gonna end this here and then we'll quickly go through part D. Now you guys are probably sick of hearing things about the brain, um, but I think this chapter is kind of interesting. Maybe that's just me. If you're still with me, you might feel that way. All right, so part D is a little bit shorter and um, I'm thinking there'll be some more just basic anatomy in part D that we'll skip over. So the spinal cord, anatomy and protection, the spinal cord is enclosed in the vertebral column. The functions are the communication to and from the brain and the body. Um, and it's also functions as a major reflex center. So sometimes reflexes are initiated and completed at the spinal cord level. So that means that um, some sort of response, let's say you step on a tack or um, you touch a hot stove, the reflex to withdraw your hand or leg from a painful stimuli um, won't go up to the brain. It'll just happen right at the spinal cord level. So here's some gross anatomy of the spinal cord, a dorsal view from the back. Um, I'm gonna let you guys read through a little bit of the anatomy. Um, the dural and arachnoid membra membranes extend to your sacrum beyond the end of the cord of L1 or L2. And this is the site of the lumbar puncture or tap um, to check for any abnormalities in the cerebral spinal fluid levels. And this is a look at how they do a lumbar puncture or tap. Um, and they do this often again, what they're doing is they're checking your cerebral spinal fluid for anything abnormal in that fluid. More um, gross anatomy and protection of the spinal cord is shown here. I'm gonna let you guys read through a little bit more of this on your own. Oops, and I was going in the opposite direction. So sorry about that. Uh, spinal nerves are part of the peripheral nervous system. They're attached to the spinal cord by 31 paired roots. Um, the cauda equina is the collection of nerve roots at the inferior end of the vertebral canal as shown there at the end. It's fun to see um, if you ever get to a dissected cadaver, it's, I think it's really neat to see the um, phylum terminale and the cauda equina uh, to actually see the spinal cord um, is neat to see in a, a cadaver. But you can see that here with the spinal cord and then the dorsal root, the spinal um, nerves coming off of each segment between the vertebrae. And here's the conus medullaris, the end of the spinal cord, the cauda equina and the phylum terminale. Here are the um, spinal cord and how it kind of sits um, within the vertebrae and how different spinal nerves come off. Each spinal nerve is named for whatever vertebrae that it comes out underneath, um, except for the first one, which is spinal cord C1. There's two lengthwise grooves um, that run the length. Sorry for that little pause, I had a daughter come in here. Um, so the central canal runs the length of the cord and that's filled with the cerebral spinal fluid. And then there's two lengthwise grooves, the ventral and dorsal median kind of fissure and sulcus. The gray matter is always located in the core of the spinal cord and the white matter is on the outside. And this is a really typical um, picture that you're probably familiar with from anatomy. Um, just looking at how the spinal cord sits in between the vertebrae um, and how the spinal nerves come off the spinal cord. Here's another typical look of the anatomy of the spinal cord showing the different layers of the dura matter, arachnoid matter, and pia matter. So those three layers continue within the spinal cord as well. Gray matter and spinal roots. So the gray matter makes that butterfly or letter H shape. And there's three areas of the gray matter that are found on each side of the center. Either you have your dorsal horns, which um, will receive somatic and visceral sensory input. Those will be on the posterior side of the spinal cord. Ventral horns, some are interneurons, but these are your somatic motor neurons that will send out a motor response. And then lateral horns are your sympathetic neurons. They're only in the thoracic and superior lumbar regions. Um, more anatomy about the spinal cord. I think I'm gonna skip over this for now because um, I think you can read through and look at a picture studying that. Um, the gray matter and the spinal roots is divided into four groups based on whether it's a somatic or visceral in innervation. And we'll go over a lot of this 
um, either in this chapter or the next, kind of talking about the different uh, types. So this is a really great picture that I do want you guys to know. So all, um, all somatic and visceral sensory input comes in through the dorsal root, through the dorsal root. This is the sensory um, root of the spinal nerve, and it enters into the gray matter, and it will either synapse on interneurons or go directly to visceral motor or somatic motor neurons. And knowing these four types of neurons is important because somatic sensory, visceral sensory, visceral motor, and somatic motor neurons will all have play a different role in your nervous system. They, the sensory neurons travel in through the dorsal root, and then they will elicit a motor response that travels out through the ventral root. And the, again, the neurons can be either somatic or visceral. And for the most part, um, somatic means they're coming from your skeletal muscles or joints. Visceral means it's coming from um, in some sort of viscera or organ. The visceral motor autonomic neurons, those, that's your autonomic response going to your viscera or organs. And somatic motor neurons are going to your muscles. The white matter then contains myelinated and non-myelinated nerve fibers that allow for communication between parts of the spinal cord and the spinal cord and brain. It runs in three different directions, either ascending up to your higher centers. These will be all sensory inputs. Descending from the brain to the cord or lower cord levels. These are your motor outputs. And then the transverse um, from one side to the other. White matter is divided into three white columns, also called funiculi, uh, the dorsal, lateral, and ventral, whether depending on what side it is in the spinal cord. And each spinal tract is composed of axons with similar destinations and functions. So here's a look at the um, white columns, also called funiculi. Um, and then you can see the gray matter, how that is divided into different horns as well. And again, you can see the dorsal root ganglia leading to the dorsal root, which will contain all sensory input coming into the spinal cord from the back. And then all motor output cuts out the ventral or front root. And again, the dorsal and ventral roots combine to form one spinal nerve. Here's a look at the ascending and descending tracks of the white matter. And these are important because different reflexes, responses, stimuli go up to the brain and come back down through the spinal cord in very specific locations in the white matter. The spinal cord trauma, so localized injury to the spinal cord or its roots can lead to a functional loss. Paresthesis is caused by the damage to the dorsal roots or sensory tracts. So this will lead to some sort of sensory function loss. Paralysis is caused by damage to the ventral roots or ventral horn cells, and this leads to motor function loss. And there's two types of paralysis, either flaccid or spastic. Uh, flaccid is severe damage to your ventral root or ventral horns, where your muscles will atrophy. Impulses do not reach your muscles at all, so there's no voluntary or involuntary control of your muscles. Spastic paralysis is a damage to an upper motor neuron of the primary motor cortex, so the spinal motor, spinal neurons remain intact, but the muscles are stimulated by reflex activity. Well, so you'll have no voluntary control of muscles and muscles will often shorten permanently. Spinal cord trauma, uh, a transection, which is a complete cut or cross section of the spinal cord at any level will result in total motor and sensory loss in the region inferior to the cut. So paraplegia, is a transection between T1 and L4 affecting the legs and quadriplegia is the transection in the cervical region. So that would, um, where the word quadriplegic comes from, so they would have no control over their arms or legs. Spinal shock is just a transient period of functional loss uh, directly caudal to the lesion. Uh, poliomyelitis is the destruction of the ventral horn motor neurons by the poliovirus. The muscles atrophy and death may occur from paralysis of the respiratory muscles, specifically your diaphragm or cardiac arrest. Survivors often develop post-polio syndrome many years later um, from the damage to their neurons. ALS um, is also called Lou Gehrig's disease. It's destruction of the ventral horn, motor neurons and fibers of the pyramidal tract. The symptoms are the loss of ability to speak, swallow and breathe. Um, and death usually typically occurs within five years. It's usually caused by an environmental factor and genetic um, mutation involving RNA processing. 
Um, the drug Riluzole will interfere with glutamate signaling, but it's only a treatment and not necessarily a cure. So then we'll talk a little bit about neuronal pathways. These are major spinal tracts that are part of a multi-neuron pathway. So the way that neurons communicate uh, with each other. There's four key points about spinal tracts and pathways that I want you guys to know. Decussation refers to the fact that most of these pathways cross from one side of your central nervous system to the other at some point and at different parts in this nervous system. A relay consists of a chain of two or three neurons. Somatotopy is the precise spatial relationship in the central nervous system, which correspond to spatial relationships in the body. And symmetry are the pathways that are paired symmetrically, uh, such as right and left. So first order neuron is, conducts an impulse from a cutaneous receptor. It branches diffusely as it enters the spinal cord or medulla, and it will synapse with a second order neuron. A second order neuron is an interneuron. It has axons extending to the thalamus and cerebellum. A third order neuron can also be an interneuron, but its cell bodies will be in a thalamus, um, and the axon extends to usually the somatosensory cortex. So those are the three orders of neurons. Somatosensory signaling travels along three main pathways. Um, two pathways transmit somatosensory information to the sensory cortex by going through the thalamus first. If you remember, the thalamus was the key kind of relay point. It receives all sensory information of the body. Uh, the dorsal column medial lamensical pathway, often abbreviated DCML, and then the spinal thalamic pathway are the two kind of ones that we're going to focus on a lot. They provide for discriminatory touch and conscious proprioception, proprioception, which is just the ability for you to know where your um, body parts exist in relationship to each other. There's a third pathway um, that terminates in the cerebellum. So the DCNL pathway trans transmits input to your somatosensory cortex, and the spinothalamic pathway is more lateral and ventral that transmits pain, temperature, coarse touch, and pressure impulses. And then the spinal cerebral tract conveys information about muscle or tendon stretch. So again, these three tracts just transmit some, any sort of sensation to the brain. So here's a look at the pathways of the selective tracts and where they decussate or cross over. So you can see here um, a little bit of the medial lemniscus tract. Um, it, it doesn't say where they decussate and cross over yet. We'll get to that. Here's the next tract. Actually, it does show here where they cross over. You can kind of see the crossing over occurs when it starts on one side of the body and it will cross over to the other side of the body. So here is a great chart. So um, again, I like these charts because I think it helps with your study purposes and I won't ask you too many questions outside of these charts. Um, it tells you about the three spinal cord tracts, their main function, um, their origin and termination, and it should tell you where they cross over from one side of the spine, um, one side of the CNS to the other. Descending pathways. So we talked about the ascending pathways. Descending pathways deliver efferent impulses or um, effecting motor impulses to, from the brain to the spinal cord. They can either be a direct pathway or an indirect pathway. Motor pathways involve two neurons, an upper and a lower motor neuron. Direct pathways um, descend directly without synapsing. They will regulate fast and fine skilled movements as shown here. And indirect pathways are complex, they're multi-somatic. They'll convey, contain many neurons. These pathways regulate axial muscles, muscles controlling coarse limb movements and head, neck and eye movements. And I think that's all you guys need to really know about that. So here is more of the indirect pathway. And again, these um, kind of graphs are, or these charts are good just as a basic review. And I won't ask you too many other than that. This is an incredibly cool picture to me because it just shows the fiber tracks in the brain and spinal cord. So what we've just talked to you about, we're teaching you um, these tracks that are traveling to all, all parts of the brain and the spinal cord. And you can see the different colors of these neurons, these fibers and how they go to every part of the brain. So it's kind of a cool picture to see. So we're finally done with chapter 12. I know this was a heavy chapter. Um, this is kind of a lecture heavy module in general. So that's why we only have two labs, I think.
um, in this module. Chapter 13 will be a little heavy as well, um, but we'll do that in the next lecture. So thanks for listening, guys.